Well, welcome back. It is your Feel Good Breakfast Show Expresso on S3. And yes, it is Friday. We've made it through the full working week, but not without accumulating a bunch of questions about what's happening in the news headlines. So we thought and we brought news editor Roy Simpson in studio to unpack what's been going on. And as always, we'd love to know what your take is on some of the stories. So please share your thoughts with us. Join this conversation. Our WhatsApp number is open to you at 63 808 -8863. Or you can ask us those questions on social media. But let's get straight into it. In the long debate about electricity, the question of nuclear power, it always comes up. The Kuburg nuclear power plant near Cape Town produces almost 2,000 megawatts of power. That's two stages of load shedding. But it also means that it needs to be switched off next year after 40 years of operation. My question to Roy is, is it possible for them to switch it off, given our current circumstances? That would be a really tricky decision to make. <clears throat> um, there are a number of other remedial things in, in the pipeline. There, there are plans to replace that power. And, I mean, we've known for 40 years that, that Kuwait needs to be switched off next year. But for, for quite some time, in fact, all the way, oh, way back in like 2012 already, I know the government was floating the idea of extending the life of this. I think already at that point, they could see the writing that they, they hadn't done the investments they needed to, to provide us with enough electricity. And so this was, it's quite an easy alternative in a way. Okay. And the theory is that it's a relatively cheap alternative rather than building something new to keep those 2,000 megawatts that you mentioned in, in the grid. And I mean, we know our grid is extremely fragile at the moment. What are some of those safety implications that could occur if the Kuburg power plant had to be extended by another 20 years? Well, that really is the whole debate. Uh, the idea that we're going to spend 20 billion rand on extending its life for 20 years, that seems like good value for money. Although I must say that number that, that was floated in Parliament of 20 billion is a hugely suspicious one because that number hasn't changed in about a decade. And okay. of course, <laughs> prices have changed, as you and I know. Uh, the safety issue is a huge one. Uh, there, there are a couple of things at play there. Radioactivity is always what we're worried about, of course. Yeah. It's, it's an incredibly dangerous thing and a difficult thing to contain. And, and that's been proven uh, over the world and an expensive thing to contain as well. Uh, an issue which is also in the background is that in the part, since 1969, there have been five seismic events in and around the Cape Town area. Three of those have occurred in the last four years. There was one in 2020, two in uh, 2021, I think it was, or 22. So that's a lot of recent activity that, that is concerning, given that you have a nuclear power plant there. And Fukushima in uh, J Japan, yeah. that disaster, which is one of the two big disasters, that disaster boiled down to an earthquake. So, so there's that question, and, and the geological data that uh, ESCOM operates on in, in determining safety, man, that dates back to the 1970s when they were planning to build this thing. So, so it's severely out of date, and the science, the technology has improved so much since then that we might get a completely different picture of how safe it is. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's not even the end of the safety issues. I know. So there are a lot of safety concerns, mm. but I think what concerns me, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of South Africans, is we have known for how many years now that the Kubrick power plant needs to be shut down. Do we know what progress has been made in order for us to reach that milestone? Has ESCOM and the government done the necessary infrastructure changes to be able to do that? We're not as clear as we should be. Okay. A lot of the stuff has been happening in secrecy, and this agenda has been driven quite hard by Guido Montache, for one, for example. And, and it's, it's tied into to the whole deals with Russia that we've, we've been floated. But the National Nuclear Regulator has promised a discussion paper for public participation to come out now, uh, before the end of the year. They say they're going to make a decision before the second quarter of next year. So that's quite a short time frame. Uh, and it indicates that government's plans are really far advanced. And in fact, if you read between the lines, that they plan to do this and they're just going to ram it through 
So, so yeah, that's where we're at. We're, we're, it's pretty much fait accompli, it's gonna happen. Okay, um, well listen, you mentioned Russia. I have a bunch of questions given the news headlines I read this morning. So of course, stay tuned, Roy Simpson, he is here. If you wanna be part of this conversation, feel free to send us a voice note. Our number is 063-408-8863. It's my feel good breakfast show. Well, we are back with our look at the major news stories of the week right here on your Feel Good Breakfast show and with our news editor, Roy Simpson. Now, he's here to help us understand all of the different implications of what we've been talking about. So before the break, we were chatting about the future of the Kuburg power plant. We also touched on a little bit about what's happening with Russia and we received a voice note and we encourage you to be part of this conversation. Our number is 063-408-8863. Now, the first voice note we received was from Johan Roy. Let's take a listen to what Johan had to say. Good morning. Morning, Expresso. With the new headlines that South Africa has um, provided arms to aid Russia with the Ukraine war, uh, will South Africa face any kind of repercussions like being sanctioned? Is that also obviously a large part why the, the rand is weakening towards the, uh, against the dollar? Very interesting. I, like I mean, that. in my news headlines this morning, we were talking about the U.S. Embassy for South Africa, um, ambassador f uh, to South Africa. Um, how is this going to impact the rand? Because we saw yesterday a very high or weak rand to dollar value. Absolutely. So, so, so the answer, as usual with these things, is, is somewhat more complex. Over the past year, for example, the rand has lost uh, 19 point something percent of its value against the dollar. Over the past five days, that's, that's about 4%. So, so there's, there's a long trajectory downward in terms of the relationship between the rand and the dollar. But of course, uh, what's being referred to here is Ruben E. Brigitte going and saying that America believes that South Africa has been supplying arms to Russia. And, and I had to sit and track the, the exact movements of the RAND over the day, literally like hour by hour, minute by minute. And there is a direct correlation between that statement being made and a 2% drop in the next 60 minutes. Sure. So, so that's a definite impact. And yes, the, the, what seems to be driving that is the idea that if he's willing to say that in public, it's very unambassadorial to say something like that in public in the host country. So if he's willing to say that, then when he was overseas talking about AGOA and all these other special trade relationships we have, something must have been said to him that indicates that America's political infrastructure has lost patience with us. And that 2% drop is an indication that there's a fear among investors that we will be punished for our stance on Russia. So that's, that's the 2% is just on ooh, that sort of jittery feeling that that might be coming. And I mean, there are a lot of uncertainty also with South Africa being part of the ICC and Amer the US not. And of course, we've got that BRICS summit coming up. We've got it here in the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Russia is pretty rigid on BRICS summit, according to the Mail and Guardian yeah. here on page 12. No, Actually, it's not page 12. Yeah, on the front, Over there, on on the the front, front page, page as well. They've got all Fuji's on it and gone ready or not, here I come. So, so let's just quickly unpack this. Obviously, the International Criminal Court, they have have a warrant of arrest for President Putin for his war, the claims of cri war crimes in Russia. Mm. Now, uh, sorry, in Ukraine. And South Africa, we are part of the International Criminal Court. We have to honor what that Correct. warrant is. We are hosting the BRICS summit and now South Africa is encouraging Russia to attend it virtually and Russia is saying, nope, we want to be in South Africa. Is that what they are saying? Well, that certainly seems to be this. We haven't had a chance to read this yet. It's, it's fresh off the press. <laughs> uh, what we were trying to do was, as you say, to encourage and go, come on, we're in bricks. Don't embarrass us. Don't make this difficult. You can do this virtually. We'll, basically, we'll, we'll come up with an excuse and a reason. But, I mean, Narendra Modi is going to be coming here from India. All the other international leaders are. It would be very clear that this is about that ICC warrant. And really we're in an invidious position. Either choice is a bad choice for us. And, and if they're gonna play hardline, they're playing hardline because 
they can very clearly demonstrate on, on the international stage that we are in their camp. This is, this is a big geopolitical power play. Power play. And, and to have South Africa as a gold producer, interestingly enough, in the, the Russia-China camp so clearly would really work for them. And I don't know how we get out of this. I, I don't know how we, could, how we could avoid, if he decides he's coming, the, skipping out on our obligations on the Rome Statute. We can't arrest this guy if he comes here. And he knows it. Oh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Indeed. A lot to look out for. And of course, we still have so much to unpack, but we appreciate every voice note that comes through. Mm. If you want to weigh in, welcome to do so on our WhatsApp line 063 408 8863. Roy Simpson's not going anywhere. We've still got more headlines to, to unpack. <laughs> it's my feel good breakfast show. Welcome back to your Feel Good Breakfast show on S3 and you are back just in time as we take a final look at the major news stories of the week and we're all about talking about the relationships between South Africa, Russia, India, the whole BRICS nation. And if you want to be part of this conversation, join us on WhatsApp. We also have our news editor, Roy Simpson, here. Now, Roy, we've... Uh, Russia, mm. BRICS, all of that's been dominating our chat this morning and I feel like we have a little more to unpack. The world has been putting on sanctions against Russia for, its, uh, for the, the world, has been putting sanctions on Russia for its war in Ukraine. And there are talks that, you know, India has been benefiting yes. with, when it comes to the cheaper oil. Is that, is that true? Is there truth to that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's pretty hard evidence on that. In fact, at one point when we were back in... I think it was around December of last year, there was an estimate that came out uh, by what, one of the major news houses, I don't want to uh, miss, misspeak here, but they reckoned that they were getting oil at about $35 a barrel cheaper, which is a substantial amount. Uh, recently, I read something in the India Express, I think just yesterday, suggesting that the discount rate for Russian oil, for Ural's oil, to, uh, to India is about 10%. So they're getting it at about $15 a barrel less uh, on a price of about $110. So, so yeah, a little more than 10% discount on the oil. And what are the chances that South Africa could be, could be on the, the receiving end of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's an evil question that you ask. It is an evil so. question. But it, but it is. That has to be part of the calculus. If we are now going to, and, and potentially increasingly, be seen as part of the, the world that is the BRICS world that is dominated by, by Russia and China geopolitically, then, then what are we going to gain from that? We know that China is our biggest trade partner but at about what, $11 billion a year, but just behind it is the United States of America. So, so there would have to be quid pro quo if we are going to uh, really annoy America and, and push them to, to give us or, or to take away these, these special trade relationships that we have, what would the quid pro quo be? And, and yes, you have to speculate. It would be nice to get cheaper fuel. Uh, the, the ESCOM's planning to burn 30 billion rand in diesel. It would be nice if we could get 10% more diesel for that. So I, I don't know if that maths is really happening in, in, in a real debate sense. But yeah, we have to consider that as, as one of the things that might come. Keyword, speculate. Absolutely. We are speculating here. Now, let's go out of this world, Japan. Yeah. They had what looked or people assumed to be a shooting star, but in fact, it was a space satellite that re-entered Earth's orbit. <laughs> it was, in fact, a Chinese satellite. Uh, and, and these things have been happening a couple of times. In March this year, out in California at Sacramento, uh, there was a spectacular one. The video was circulating online a lot. Loads of fireballs sort of moving together in, in a sequence. A really, really amazing sight. And, of course, people started asking, what's this all about? And the answer was, th these were obsolete pieces of equipment that they jettisoned out of the International Space Station back in 2020. Sure. So, so this, this stuff is falling out of the sky somewhat regularly. Sh should we be worried? Because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's talks of a lot of space junk. 
and that being an issue one of these days. Yes, so the United States uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, this organization anyway tracks these things, they say that about 200 pieces of space junk fall to the Earth every year. That's almost one a day. The thing is, most of it falls over the oceans. We don't see it and we don't experience it. But I can't say to you with that kind of number that, no, you might not suddenly be hit by a piece of space junk. So it's a real issue. It's something we're going to have to deal with in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Roy, it's been amazing having you here. Thank you. Thank you for helping us unpack these headlines. And of course, this weekend, we'll probably have more news to unpack. So we are looking forward to having another one of these sessions with you. But thank you for joining in on the conversation. And our WhatsApp line is always open to you. So feel free to join any conversation you see on your Feel Good Breakfast show. Our number is 063 four zero eight double eight six three.